Hello guys, my name is Edward Sereduk and today I welcome you to a new teaching session from the series Save for Eternity where we continue to discuss two new objections against eternal salvation and those are, one is from the, the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 verses 1 to 13 and the second is about doing the will of the Father as a condition to enter the kingdom of heaven uh, in Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. So let's begin with the first one from Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, and read the, the biblical text. Uh, I will read from New King James Version translation. And it says this, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went, went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Amen. The most common interpretation of this parable is that those ten virgins represent born-again believers belonging to the kingdom of God who were, were all saved at one point. Then some of them lost their salvation due to their lack of watchfulness in morality and good works. Let's analyze first what we know for sure about this parable. First, the parable is about the kingdom of heaven, about a bridegroom who is King Jesus, and about ten virgins who represent the visible church of Christ. Second, the action in this parable occurs between the first and second coming of Jesus. Third, the harshness, the harshness of the bridegroom's answer in verse 12, where it says, I don't know you or I never knew you, makes very clear this parable is about an eternal matter of life and death, respectively the matter of eternal salvation into the kingdom of God or eternal damnation. Fourth, it's also obvious that when the bridegroom came, alluding to the second coming of Jesus, some of those virgins representing some Christians participated in the wedding of the Lamb. That means they entered heaven while the rest were rejected and went to hell. Only three things are left to elucidate. First, what do the oil in the lamps and the extra oil in the jars represent? Second, were the people rejected genuinely born again in the first place or not? Third, what does watchfulness mean? The oil in the Old Testament was used to anoint kings and priests. It was a picture of anointing to work for God, to, to be consecrated to, for, to God. Let's see that. We see that in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, where it says this. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, meaning David, in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. In the New Testament, believers are anointed with the Holy Spirit as we see in these passages. I'll read about four passages that show this. Acts 10, verse 38, 38, yes, where it says this, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power 
who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And 2 Corinthians 1 verses, verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. Then let's read also 1 John 2 verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. And lastly, 1 John 2 verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you don't need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you, you will abide in Him. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and believers are also anointed with the Holy Spirit at the time of salvation. 1 John 2.27 says that the anointing the believers receive from Him abides in them and teaches them all things. According to John 14 verse 16 and 14 verse 26 and 16 verse 13, the Holy Spirit is the helper given to believers to be with them forever, teach them all things and lead them into all truth. So the oil in the parable of the virgins is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The light of the lamps represents good works, morality, fruits of the Spirit, or different divine acts of the Spirit like healing the sick, casting out demons, and raising the dead. In other words, that light of the lamps is any manifestation of the kingdom, of the Holy Spirit in, in the exterior. Now, what is the difference between the oil already in the lamps and the oil in the extra jars? On one hand, based on John 14, verse 16, and 1 John 2, 27, we know that once the Holy Spirit comes into believers, He abides in them forever. He no longer comes and lives like he used to do in the Old Testament with the people of God. Although many Christians that I met today, they believe that even in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes and go, goes, but it's not true. Moreover, Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14 strengthens this eternal presence of the Holy Spirit in believers by asserting that he is a seal of salvation, a guarantee of believers' inheritance until they acquire full possession of it. Let's read Ephesians 1, verses 13 to 14. It says this, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Amen. The Greek word translated as guarantee in this passage, the Greek arabon, is a legal and commercial term that means first installment, deposit, down payment, or pledge. It represents a payment that obligates the contracting party to make further further payments. When God gave believers the Holy Spirit, He committed Himself to give them all the consequent blessings of eternal life as well as a great reward in heaven with Him. So the five virgins for whom lamps cease to burn cannot represent genuinely born-again believers who once had the Holy Spirit in them as a seal and then lost Him. On the other hand, a closer look into Scripture in both the Old and New Testaments, will reveal that the Holy Spirit can come over people just for a while, for them to fulfill some divine tasks or even to do good works. However, it is not necessary for the Holy Spirit to remain inside them in a saving way. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, but not in them. A few examples from the Old Testament include Samson, who received the spirit and anointing of might, King Saul, who received the spirit of prophecy, Joshua and King Solomon, who both received the spirit of wisdom in different measures. All those people burned for a while by the anointing of the Holy Spirit without being saved during their lifetime because Jesus had not come yet. At that moment in history, they belonged to the kingdom of darkness. 
Now coming into the New Testament in the age before the death of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, healed people and cast out demons through the Holy Spirit together with the other disciples, but he was called the son of perdition in John 17 verse 12 and ended his life without being saved. Furthermore, as we have seen earlier in Hebrews 6 verses 4 to 6, there can be people represented by the rocky ground from the parable of the sower who are enlightened with the gospel, who taste the heavenly gift, who become partakers of the work of the Holy Spirit, and who taste the good word of God, but have no root in themselves. These people continue to rely on their good works, morality, and self-righteousness for acceptance before God. Moreover, Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23 seems to imply somehow that there can be people who prophesy, who cast out demons, and who do mighty works in Jesus' name, but still are not recognized by Jesus in the end. The way Jesus didn't recognize the foolish virgins virgins is not different. Let's read Matthew 7 uh, verses 21 to 23. It says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 1 John 2.19 advocates as well that those who apparently departed from faith were not really in it. For if they had been, they would have continued until the end. But they went out, and so it became clear they had not been in faith. Let's read 1 John 2 verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that uh, that none of them were of us. Now putting all these facts together... Who are these people who are not genuinely born again but have a very strong appearance of being saved by their eternal deeds? Their works even consist of miracles of healing and acts of deliverance. They can be included in three categories. The first one is people who are sincerely excited about Christ, who stay for a while in the church and try to model their lives after biblical principles but never take a decision for Jesus. We already know the gifts of God are irrevocable. We see that in Romans 11 verse 29. We know he can use even a donkey for his purposes like he did with Balaam's donkey. Since God loves people so much, we can conclude that he can use even these unsaved people to touch other people's lives through miracles for the sake of them who are being ministered to. However, that is not necessarily a guarantee of salvation for the people doing the ministry. The use of supernatural powers is not equal to being born again. And I'll repeat this. The use of supernatural, use of supernatural powers is not equal to being born again. Outwardly, like the virgin's lamps, these professing believers can seem to burn and shine for a while externally without that light having any saving effect on them. Salvation is a love relationship with Christ based on faith. It's beyond gifts and miracles. The second category of of this type of people can be the nominal Christians, good moral people who have an appreciation for Christian principles and values and call themselves Christian. These people go to church from time to time, but have no saving relationship with Christ. And they are usually Greek Orthodox Christians, many of the Roman Catholics, Anglicans, and even some Protestants, especially in the United States of America. The third category of this type of of people can be people who belong to Satan, who deliberately portray themselves as Christians and even perform miracles using the power of Satan, with the sole purpose of deceiving people, even the elect. These people can seem to preach the truth of the Bible, 
but secretly twist some parts of it in a subtle way so the differences would not be easily recognized and be able to deceive others. In Matthew 24, verse 24, Jesus warns his disciples that in the end times, false Christs and prophets will rise and intentionally perform great signs and wonders to deceive people. Let's read Matthew 24, verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Moreover, in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15, the Apostle Paul says, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light and has ministers who also transform themselves into apostles of Christ and ministers of righteousness. Let's read this text. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Now, if you are like me, you are probably wondering, are there such people? If yes, how do they look like? I had the same doubt until one day I met a young man just in the same period when I asked the Holy Spirit about these challenging verses. This young man was a hard rock musician and songwriter, and he had been involved in the occult even when he wrote his songs. He told me his bandmates worshipped Lucifer. Listen to me. They worshipped Lucifer regularly for worldly benefits like fame, money, and pleasures. He also told me he knew people who worshipped Satan and performed miracles using his power, but they deliberately portrayed themselves as Christians to deceive people. They preached 80% of the truth and 20% very subtle twists to the core truth. I was shocked to hear that. But it brought more light to me regarding these verses, that such people exist, ministers of Satan disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. By now, it has probably become clear that the extra jar of oil represents the invisible part only authentic believers have. That invisible part is the Holy Spirit present as a seal of salvation within believers, consequent to their faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit came to stay in them for eternity. Those without the extra jar of oil may generate a similar light as those having it. They may burn for a while, but they are not really saved. In their case, the Holy Spirit might have only come upon them and not in them. This conclusion is also supported by the strong statement that Jesus made to these people in Matthew 25, verse 12 and 7, 23. I don't know you, or I never knew you. If these people were once saved authentically and then lost their salvation through evil deeds, Jesus could not have told them he never knew them. He could not have told them something like, yes, I knew you once, but now you no longer belong to me. That would be more appropriate if these people had ever put their faith in Jesus and made him Lord in a saving way. Now, it's imperative to remember that people who don't want to be rejected to enter heaven and wander themselves in fear, if they are in that category, they can rest assured that they are not. The simple fact that they are asking themselves that question and this issue preoccupies them proves beyond a shadow of a doubt they are not in that category. People who have consciously put their faith in Christ and have confessed Him as Lord of their lives can never get into the lost group without their knowing. Last, what does it mean to watch? As I mentioned before, preparedness or watchfulness is the mark of faith which is the only prerequisite for entrance into the kingdom of heaven and participating in the celebration of the wedding feast of the bridegroom. Some people stress alertness, but forget that in the parable of the virgins, they were all asleep. They were not alert. They were not watching. They were asleep. So preparedness is the response of faith to the message of the gospel, which enables one to be received in the kingdom at the time of the bridegroom's unexpected arrival. 
The lack of proper preparation is the demonstration of unbelief in Christ's sacrifice as the only way of salvation which will disqualify one from the entrance and enjoyment of the kingdom. Amen. Now let's move on to the second objections from Matt, objection from Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23 where we cover and discuss about doing the will of the Father as a prerequisite to enter the kingdom of heaven, if it's true or not. So let's read first the passage from Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. I'm reading from New King James Version translation. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I explained this passage a little bit in the previous section where I talked about the ten virgins, but here we will look at the same verses from a slightly different angle. Christians may disagree over what constitutes the scariest passage in the Bible, but most would agree Jesus' concluding words in the Sermon on the Mount rank near the top. It's frightening to think about going to hell. It's more terrifying to find out too late that you are going to hell when you thought you were going to heaven. And it is, it is even more alarming to think that not just a few, but many will have this experience. This is one of the reasons some people use this passage to threaten Christians with the possibility of losing their salvation if they practice lawlessness and don't do the will of the Father. They preach something along these lines. You can be genuine born-again believer in Christ who calls Jesus Lord, and you can even prophesy, cast out demons, and perform many wonders in Jesus' name. But if you're not careful to do the will of the Father all the time, and if you practice lawlessness, you might have the big unpleasant surprise not to enter the kingdom of heaven when you stand before God on judgment day. Is that so? First, let's think about what Jesus means by the will of the Father and who are those who do it. Judging by the context, it must mean more than simply saying, Lord, Lord, and doing mighty works in Jesus' name. Today, one popular view suggests that by the expression, the will of my Father, Jesus meant a life characterized by obedience to all the Father has commanded. Thus, those who do the will of the Father will be those who live godly and holy lives. There are several problems with this interpretation. First, God is perfect and one cannot enter his kingdom without becoming perfect like him, according to Matthew 5.48. Second, one cannot be said to have done the will of the Father unless he does it entirely, 100%. To violate even just one of God's commands is to break them all, according to James 2 verse 10. Third, even if these first two arguments are not valid, this view leads to the unbiblical conclusion that no one can ever be sure they are saved except at their death. No one could ever know if, if they have obeyed enough. Yet the scriptures are clear that the apostles knew with absolute certainty they were saved and they wanted their readers to know this as well. We see that in 1 John 5 verse 13. There is another view of what Jesus meant by the expression, the will of my Father. When Jesus spoke of doing the will of the Father to obtain kingdom entrance, he had one act of obedience in mind, believing the gospel. Jesus says in John 6 verse 40 this, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then in John 6, verse 29, he tells us plainly, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. This is the gospel. This is doing the will of the Father. Jesus also said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, in Hebrews 10, verse 9. What was that will Jesus had to fulfill? It was to die for our sins and bring us into his new covenant of grace. 
the same verse tells us he takes away the first, meaning the old covenant, and that he may establish the second, the new covenant. So what Jesus was saying in Matthew 7 is this. Not all who call me Lord, Lord in that day are saved, but only those who fulfill my Father's will, which is to believe in me. This is the will of the Father concerning eternal salvation. He's not saying that the moment you make a mistake in thought or deed, he denies you and you have lost your salvation. And yes, there is also a will of the Father concerning our way of living after we enter the kingdom of God, but this is his will for our life on earth, which is to be lived according to the new position of holiness into which he brought us. And it's not a condition to remain in the kingdom, but rather to take advantage of all the benefits of the gospel, fulfill our God-given destiny, and make him proud in front of people so they will give glory to God. This second will of God is revealed in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 3 to 7 where it says this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all, such as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. So we are to walk in holiness, not so we remain saved, but because he already made us holy. He brought us into the realm of holiness. In our initial scripture of this uh, uh, section, uh, of this objection, notice that our Lord Jesus says, I never knew you. This cannot be applied to born-again believers who have a relationship with the Lord. It refers to people who never had a personal relationship with the Lord. That is why Jesus could say to the latter group, I never knew you. This passage is to be used as a warning only to professors of the Christian faith not to those who have genuinely accept Jesus, accepted Jesus as their Lord in their lives. You may wonder now, then who are these people who do not belong to God and never did, but still can perform miracles? Can those who do not have the Spirit cast out demons, perform miraculous healings, spectacular signs and wonders? As I already described in detail in the section about the ten virgins, who these people might be, there are roughly two possible explanations for the ability of the ungodly to perform such acts. One is that some miracles are done by the power of Satan and his demonic host, according to Matthew 24, verse 24, and 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. And we know Satan is very crafty. There may be times when Satan stages even an exorcism or healing in which an unbeliever commands a demon or a sickness to live and the demon pretends to comply to create fear in onlookers and cause them to trust in herbs, incantations, talismans, holy water, and relics rather than in God. Second, God may empower unbelievers temporarily to perform miraculous deeds because of his love for people and for his purposes. Such an example is Judas Iscariot, who along with the other disciples, preached the gospel and we assume healed the sick and performed other miracles. There is nothing to indicate that Judas didn't have the same power as the other 11 disciples, although he was never a true disciple of Christ. He was a deceiver and the son of perdition, as John 17 verse 12 uh, uh, specifies. If Judas did perform miracles, despite the condition of Judas's heart, it was only because God saw fit to use him for his glory. This is all that I had for today, and until we hear each other again in the next session, I pray that God will bless you, bless your lives, and surround you with his favor in all areas of your life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.